Hello, Internet. Have you ever wondered how did it happen that Western nations became the dominant forces in the world? Was it a natural supremacy, a wall of God, or simply finding alternative ways of transportation? Way back in the 15th century, Western Europe lay at the outskirts of civilized world, but few generations later it became economical center of Europe and home for not one, but many colonial empires. So how did it happen? Obviously there were many reasons, but one of the most important was a revolution in transport. Romans had roads, Mongols had their horses, and the Europeans had water. I mean access to seas and oceans which allowed to find a sea route to India that significantly shifted the geopolitical balance of power in the world. Before Vasco da Gama returned from his first sea voyage to India, the most important Eurasian trade route was the Silk Road. Existing since the 3rd century, the Silk Road measured about 12,000 km and created a network which connected China, India, Middle East and Europe. Although in use for hundreds of years, contemporary people didn't know it by its modern name, which it was given in 19th century. In all likelihood, it didn't have a name at all. It was just a network of land and sea routes, traditionally used by merchants who almost never traveled the all of its length. Instead, they just moved goods between certain trade centers in this network, selling with profit. Subsequently, goods were resold by other merchants in other trade centers, turning profit once again. And by repeating this process, silk, jade and spices traveled west, while gold, perfumes, jewelry and agricultural products found their way east. Profits generated by this trade were noticed not only by merchants, but also many local rulers, who often protected trade routes in their domains, counting on the income that could have been made through taxes imposing traded goods. Thanks to that, a long trade route drew watchtowers, duty collection points and caravan saris, a contemporary hotel for merchants. This system functioned for centuries, while money and goods flew over contemporary religious, ethnic and civilizational divisions. Of course, humans being humans, there were some, let's say, trade disputes. For instance, after conquering the Acre, capital of the Kingdom of Jerusalem, by Muslim Mamluks in 1291, the Pope put an embargo which prohibited any trade with them. But money have a way of changing people's minds and hearts. Promise of riches of Mamluks controlled Alexandria have been far more impressive than the fear of Rome's wrath, because embargo was mostly ignored. In time, Papacy itself decided to try a softer approach while making some money on side and was selling permits for conducting trade with infidels. Profits made that way were supposed to finance upcoming crusades. The only part of original embargo still enforced didn't allow sale of weapons and a military equipment to Saracens, infidels and pagans. Even conquest of the Constantinople by the Ottoman Turks and fall of the Byzantine Empire did not influence significantly the functioning of this trade. Within just a few months, the nation simply negotiated a new trade treaty. Although the Silk Road trade centers were getting richer and richer, not everyone engaged in trade was happy about the way things were, especially those located at its western rims, which had to pay not only the price of goods themselves, but also the profit margins of 12,000 km worth of middlemen. And along the way, prices rise substantially. For example, the price of central of pepper in Calcutta was 3 ducats, but in Venice 80. Quintal of cloves in Maluku was 2 ducats, but after passing through the hands of all the middlemen, taxes and bribes for king, sheikhs and officials, it was sold on the London market for 213 ducats. To put this into perspective, at the time, a skilled Italian craftsman made around 5 ducats a month. For a long time there were no way to avoid that, but 15th century technology and knowledge about surrounding world allowed for a possibility of finding a new way to the riches of Far East. The one man that probably engaged to the greatest extent was Prince Henry of Portugal. Even though he himself avoided sea voyages, his contribution in extending the range of known world, at least known for Europeans, later earned him the name Henry the Navigator. Well, more than 400 years later and it's not used in Portugal to this day, but still counts for something. In his estate of Via de Infantes in Sagres, he gathered cartographers and astronomers who work at improving the art of navigation, at least so the common wisdom goes. But as common wisdoms tend to be, it's almost certainly a lie. Myth and legend aside, on Henry's behalf many sea expeditions were undertaken, mainly along the west coast of Africa, from which Portuguese sailors returned enriched by the new knowledge about ocean currents and wind patterns, which were crucial for Atlantic navigation. Thanks to this experience, maps were corrected, new ships built, and the subsequent expeditions organized under the auspices of a prince benefited from the achievements of the previous ones. 
In his lifetime, Henry the Navigator saw Portuguese ships reach Azores, Rio de Oro and Senegal. They were obviously valuable discoveries, but the patron saint of sailors and explorers did not live to see the moment where one of his expeditions would bring the most valuable information, location of the southmost tip of Africa. This was only to be 18 years after his death, when Bartholomew Diaz in 1488 has returned with location of the Cape of Storms, later renamed by John II, King of Portugal, as the Cape of Good Hope. Hope for prestige and splendor, but above all, the wealth it was supposed to bring him and his kingdom by opening a zero to India. Hopes that were well funded. Ten years later, Vasco da Gama became the first European to reach India by sea, and the position of Portugal in a short time has changed drastically. Even in 1498, when da Gama sailed to the west coast of India, Portugal was at the very end of a long chain of expensive deliveries of spices such as cloves and pepper, coming from Southeast Asia. 17 years later, the Venetians, who already reap huge profits from trafficking in the Mediterranean, for the first time have made their annual purchase of pepper in Lisbon, and not as so far in Alexandria. Change of economical balance of power was even by today's standards instantaneous. Subsequent political events, such as conquest of Egypt by the Ottoman Turks, or the wars led by the Holy League against them, all but solidified it. The Silk Road began to fade away into history, and states that profited from it for so long began to give away before the new sea powers. And there were quite a lot of these spatting around in a relatively short period of time. Just two years after the discovery of America by Columbus, Portugal and Spain divided among themselves spheres of influence in the New World, although it did not stop other countries interested in the overseas wealth. Encouraged by the overseas success of Iberian kingdoms, King of England, Henry VII, sent his own expedition to sail to Asia through Northern Atlantic. And although John Cabot's ships have not reached India, thanks to them, the British discovered Newfoundland. Initially, it was decided not to establish a colony over there. It was only during the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, when struggle with Spain for a sea supremacy began and the English East India Company was founded. Not long after that, in 1602, the Republic of the Seven United Netherlands established the Dutch United East India Company, the first company in history to issue its own shares to finance operations. Soon, the competition for overseas wealth was joined by France. All those countries were interested not only in the territorial conquest, but most of all, the money that could have been made on overseas trade in raw materials and commodities, which, with the development, in the art of sailing and navigation, combined with the use of new trade routes, was highly favored. In particular, because of the fact that maritime transport was, and still is, the cheapest way of moving stuff around the planet. Use of European ships to transport goods from the east not only ruled out any intermediaries lying on the ancient Silk Road, but also allowed a much more efficient transportation. You just need to load a ship in Malacca Strait or Calcutta, and after a few months of traveling around Africa, simply unload it in Amsterdam or London, with no cost of bribes to officials or fear of robbers and highwaymen. Well, for the most part. Ships do not require expensive infrastructure or roads, for the ship's captain, world seas and oceans are its own highway. Maritime transport is considered to be eight times cheaper than a land one, and in the present day, 90% of world trade is ferried by sea. Because of all that, countries in the Western Europe found themselves in a privileged position, thanks to which they could take advantage of their capital cheaper than others. Some of them managed to create empires, while others lost this competition, but that's a topic for another story. We hope you've enjoyed this video. It is our first one, so please use those like, share and subscribe buttons. Also, you can let us know what would you like to see in our next video, or simply complain in the comment section below. Alternatively, you can always press F5 a few hundred thousand times. Thanks for your time and we hope to see you later.